partner up here today. Guess not. Never mind. You guys may be seated. Unless you want to stand. That's up to you. Uh, Pastor Kenny did, uh, he gave me the opportunity to preach, preach the end of the month every, uh, every month. And this morning he did say to correct him and to fix something that he did. And the only thing that I want to correct uh, from his preaching is the walls aren't light brown. So, <laughs> so don't want to split the church, but that's, that's where I stand, right? Just kidding. So, um, am I on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Arthur? All right. I'll try and speak up and slow down. Some people have said I speak too fast, but I'll do my best, all right? If you can take your Bibles, go to Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. We're not going to stay in this text the whole evening. Um, normally when I preach, I'll preach through a passage. I'll pick a passage and we'll take, kind of take it apart. But the topic this evening, um, we're dealing on with evil. Pastor Kenny preached on evil last week. And some of the stuff may be repeated, and that's okay, but um, really the, ma the main part of it is that what I want to emphasize is what do we do with evil? Um, so Job chapter 16, we know Job went through a lot in his life. We know Job, um, in verse 2 of this, I'm not going to read it, but in verse 2 of this chapter, he calls his friends miserable comforters because they, were, they weren't good at it. Um, they didn't know how to comfort him. They didn't know what he was going through or why. They, they, they speculated and they thought they knew, but they didn't. So Job chapter 16, verse 7. Um, if you are at all discouraged, I don't, I wouldn't, this isn't a passage that I would recommend to you, but we'll read from verse 7 to 17, the first 10 verses. And we'll see Job's opinion on the whole situation, how he felt. So Job chapter 16, verse 7 says, But now he hath made me weary... Thou hast made desolate all my company, and thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me, and my, uh, my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He teareth me in his wrath, he hateth me, he gnasheth um, upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpened his eyes upon me. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me with the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. God hath delivered me to the ungodly, and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by my neck, and shaken me into pieces, and hath set me up for his mark. Verse 13. His archers compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder, and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall on the ground. Basically saying, he's basically killing me. Verse 14. He breaketh me with, uh, with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a, like a giant. I have sewed sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. My face is foul with weeping. On my eyelids is the shadow of death. Verse 17. Not for any injustice in mine hands. Also, my prayer is pure. So we kind of see Job's opinion, his how he feels in the situation, everything was bad. And if you don't know the story of Job, basically everything was taken from him. His family was, uh, was killed. His, his livestock was taken from, or killed. His house was burnt down. Everything that he had on this earth and every earthly possession was just gone in the blink of an eye. Um, and we would look at that and we would classify it as suffering, pain, or evil. Um, if you could put that picture up, Caleb. Epicarius has this quote. I'll read it. It's up there on the screen. It says, Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Why, why is there evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? So this quote is kind of putting an accusation against God saying, why is there evil? If we have a God, then why is there evil? Or some might take it the other way. If there's evil, then there cannot be a God. Um, I think it's a fair question to ask. Uh, some, peop some people on their spiritual journey or in their life, they ask, why is there evil? Or they, maybe they think about it. 
They think, why is God letting me go through this specifically? Or, or why, why is God letting this happen? Why, why are there school shootings where innocent children die? Why are there abortions where innocent, helpless children are dying? Why are there car accidents? Why do drunk drivers get in their car and go and kill a family? Why is there evil in the world? Why do evil things happen to us personally? Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. I think it's a fair and, and okay question to ask because I believe it can motivate us to, to search out the scriptures, to understand who our God is. Not to ask in a, um, a rebellious attitude, but to, to sincerely ask, you know, why does God let this happen? When we start to study it, when we start to see it, then I believe we start to understand and know our God, like uh, it says in Jeremiah. He wants us to understand him and know him. And so when we ask that question, when we're searching diligently, when we're not just asking for a, um, um, a rise out of someone, we're not just asking to be rebellious in nature, I believe it's okay. Because we all ask, why, why is there evil? But Epicurus here, he was kind of coming from an idea where it seems like he's trying to prove there is no God. Now, some of you or all of you not have faced all of these things, but face some unimaginable suffering and evil. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have had to bury children. Some of you have lost a job from different various reasons. Some of you, your money's been gone for different things. Maybe you had to pay for something and all your money was gone, all your savings is gone. Some of you have been the victims maybe of abandonment as children. Some of you have gone through a divorce, or maybe your parents went through a divorce, or, or, or certain things. Some of you have watched your life crumble around you from choices that you've made, or maybe choices other people have made in your life. Some of you guys maybe have hit rock bottom and come back. Some of you may be the uh, victim of abuse in your, in, your, in your childhood or maybe adult life. Some maybe have faced addictions. And oftentimes, these different things, what we call suffering, what we call evil, will make us ask the question, is, where are you, God? Why are you doing this to me? Or we think it, maybe we're not asking specifically, but we think, why is, why is all this bad stuff happening, happening to me? You know, you have one bad day and it just keeps happening, or bad things just keep happening. You think, you just seem to have, it, maybe it's your, you feel like, oh, this is just my lot in life, or this is just, you know, just a bad day. So why does God let this stuff happen? Richard Dawkins, um, the guy who wrote the book, um, The God Delusion, he says this. It's a pretty um, sad testament of what he believes and testament of, of where he's coming from. But he says this about our God. He says, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infocidal, genocidal, philicidal, uh, pestilential, megalom... Michael, that's the word I struggled with trying to practice this. Sado, uh, mas, mas, that's the one, yep. Masters, I'll just let Miss Lori say it for me. Malevolent bully. So I kind of stumbled my way through that from the, from the bigger words. But what Richard Dawkins was saying is God's just a bully. He's unjust. He's vindictive. He's a control freak. He loves to just kind of take his thumb and try to push it down on our life. So we know evil exists, right? We, we just look up in, your, in, in the world around us. We, we look at our own life. We know evil is there. Job faced it. We read that. He was kind of just facing all this stuff. And he's just kind of pouring his heart out and saying, everything is happening to me. God is just kind of levying all this stuff against me. Habakkuk went through it. He, he questioned God why Babylon was coming in and taking over. Now, we know that evil is, exists, but why does it exist? What, what's the purpose of evil? What is, what is God doing with this? Because if we're, if we're Christians tonight, then we need to understand that we're not immune to evil. We're not immune to suffering. We're not immune to pain. The moment we get saved, God, it's not like God says, I'm going to take this away from you, and you're going to have a carefree life. Everything's going to be easy peasy from here on out. Yeah, sunshine and roses. So as Christians, we're not immune to the experience of evil, suffering, pain. We've all experienced it. We all witness it happen. Maybe it's not experience, it's happening to us specifically in the moment, but we see it in the news. We see it on Facebook, on, on Twitter, on YouTube, or, or different things. Wherever you, wherever you look, you can see evil. 
And we know, we know evil's there, and we know, as Christians, we know God is real. Um, some people will try and use evil as a, as a way to disprove God. They'll say, well, well if, God's, if evil's here, then God can't exist. And they say there's either one or the other. You can't have both. But what I think a lot of people that question that or maybe try and argue against it or try and disprove God with evil, they don't believe that God is sovereign. They don't believe that God can use evil to bring about good. We're uh, giving the book away uh, about how God helped Joseph. Joseph, we're going to look at him uh, briefly this evening, but Joseph went through some pretty uh, twisted stuff. But yet God used the evil for good. Now, I want to look at Job's unhelpful friends this evening. Number one, Job's unhelpful friends. As he began to think along, um, along the lines of why there's evil, we want, to, we want to try and maybe equip ourselves of maybe how not to maybe help someone or what, what's, what's, what's a way we shouldn't act or how should we not treat someone who, who's going through a tough time. And if you look at Job's four friends or three friends and his wife, you can look at the blueprint of really what not to do when someone's suffering, when someone's going through something. Uh, in, the, in the first, uh, verse 2 and 3 of this chapter, take a look at it real quick. It says, I've, I, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. He's talking to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. He says, you guys are terrible comforters. Don't make this your day job because you're, you're, you're terrible at it. Verse 3, shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeth thee that thou answerest? He says, are you just going to keep going on and on and on and on about why this evil is happening to me? Why is everything taken away from me? Are you just going to keep doing this? If you look in Job 5, we're not going to read it, but if you go to Job chapter 5, you see, first of all, Eliphaz's um, advice towards Job or maybe how he can get the evil and the pain and the suffering out of his life and how he can stop it and why it's there in the first place. Job 5, it's, it's in that whole chapter. We're not going to look at a specific verse. But he said, my advice for you, Job, is to just seek God. You must not be, you just, you must not be in your Bible enough. You must not be having that devotion time with God. You must not be close enough to God. Now, we know that that's not why Job was suffering. Uh, we know that's not why Job was facing the evil. But Eliphaz just looks at it, and he just kind of gives a blanket statement. Was it really? I don't know if you can really call these friends of Job because they didn't really even know Job. They should have known that he was a man that feared God, and he eschewed evil, and he was one that had a relationship with God, I believe. But Eliphaz, maybe not knowing his friend very well, just says, you're not doing enough, man. Just go seek God. Bildad, in chapter 8, accuses Job of not being pure enough. He says, your, your life's just not set apart quite enough. You're not quite holy enough. Which is an idea I think a lot of Christians may struggle with, that when we, are, when we do bad, then God treats us bad. And when we do good, God treats us good. There's like, we kind of, you know, like Santa Claus has the naughty and nice list. Oh, are we in God's naughty list? And this must be why this terrible stuff is happening. And God does use, we're looking at it this evening, God does use some things in our life to maybe correct our behavior or to, to get us close back to him, but that's not always the case. We can't just look at everything happening and think, oh, I'm just not, I'm just not good enough for you, God, because then that puts a work on God's love. It puts, a, uh, it puts the ball in our court, and we are saying we're just not good enough. We can't measure up, and we know we can't, but we see God's grace and his, his mercy and his love and his forgiveness in that. Zophar, in Job 11, he issues a call to Job to just repent. He still doesn't understand Job's suffering. Now let's go to Job chapter 2. We'll look at his lovely wife and what she says. Job chapter 2. What an encouragement. What a help me she is for him. Job 2, 9. I'll wait for the pages to stop. Job 2.9, then said his wife unto him, so maybe he's thinking, maybe she comes in the room, maybe he's thinking, okay, she's going to be help I need. Whew. Then said his wife unto him, dost thou still re retain thine integrity? And the, three, uh, the famous words that she says, curse God and die. Now, I don't know if he was expecting her to have some encouraging words when maybe when, he come, when she approaches him, but it wasn't really encouraging words. Just curse God and die. Apparently, he's doing this to you. He's, he's being evil to you. He's taking his thumb, and he's just kind of pushing it down on you. Just curse God and die. 
We think of the suffering that we go through oftentimes as a cause and effect, like a vending machine. You put a dollar bill in or $2 or whatever it is and you push the button and you get out what you want. Soda, Dr. Pepper, club soda, Pastor Kenny. So we think of it as cause and effect. We think I have done bad, so the, the, that's the cause and the effect is God is punishing me for that. But sometimes when we do that, when we think of it that way, we think we're, we're, we're limiting what God is doing. We're putting God in a box and saying, God operates this way only. Maybe God wants us to see him in the, in the suffering. Maybe God wants, to, wants to see him in the pain. I've told the story before, but I had, uh, weren't really friends in college, but I went to college with him. He was, after college, he graduated Bible college, and his life was just really going the wrong direction. He was making the wrong choices. Gets in a terrible car accident, breaks hundreds of bones in his body, and his, uh, his dad was a pastor who was sitting there in the hospital with him, and he, was no, he knew that his son was just kind of running away, and the man that hit him, he wasn't drunk or anything, was sitting there in the hospital because he felt bad for nearly killing this, this, this kid. But that accident brought the, the student that I went with, his dad to the hospital, who was a pastor, who loved the Lord, and it brought the man who hit him to the hospital, and the dad was able to share the gospel with him, and he got saved. Now, who knows if that man would have gotten saved if, if the accident didn't happen. But people were looking at it thinking, what is going on? And people were thinking, well, maybe it's because he's making these wrong decisions, so God's just kind of maybe trying to bring him back. But there was something that God was trying to do in the evil, in the pain, and in the suffering. This gentleman got saved and now knows the Lord is his Savior. I don't know anything beyond that, how the, the, the relationship with uh, God and this man are, are doing, but I know that God worked through the evil and through the suffering. What we would look at and we think, that's terrible. That is awful. Why would God let that happen? Well, we see why. He gets saved. So Job's unhelpful friends didn't really put Job in a better spot. <laughs> and in chapter 16, that's really after all his friends came up to try and help him. And Job was just thinking, well, that's when he kind of pours his heart out to God and just says, this is awful. So we see Job's unhelpful friends. Two, I want to look at why does God allow evil in the first place? Now this is where it gets a little, a little deeper, um, a little more philosophical, kind of uh, thinking deeper. But why does God allow evil in the first place? There's a question that we must ask. Why did God, who in his sovereignty, who knows everything, who plans everything and is in control of everything, create a world in which he knew things would go wrong? A fair question. Why would God create this world, put us in it, where he knew that things would happen? Now there's this, uh, this idea that I came across this week that I had never really heard of before, but it's the, called the free will defense or the free will argument or the free will theodicy. And it states... Um, Alvin Planticus, the, it's, a, it's an older idea, but he kind of brings it up into contemporary terms in the book uh, that he wrote called God, Evil, and Freedom. He kind of states that it would be impossible for God to create a world where we have free will, we choose what we want, we can do our own thing, we're not just robots on this, on this planet, we're not just flesh robots doing what God wants us to without any, any decision, God can't create a free world where he also can't keep us from doing evil because then he takes, us, takes the freedom of choice away from us, right? We can't love God unless we have the um, option or the possibility to also hate God. Because if we're just forced to love God, then is it love in the first place at all? No. Because when, when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them a free will. And he put that tree in the garden to give them a free will. He didn't remove the tree or just remove any option from them sinning. But he wanted them to ch make the choice to love him. And what did they choose? Obviously evil, sin. And you, we've heard people, uh, usually kids in kids' church or maybe in teen class, and they'll think, well, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit, right? Well, we don't know that. <laughs> And so Alvin Plantagus, the guy who I read this, this theodicy from, this idea from, the free will um, argument, defense, if you will, he states that if God created a world where we couldn't do evil, then we couldn't ever choose to love him in the first place because it's forced. God wants us to choose to love him. I mentioned that last time I preached that with Ava, I can tell her, Ava, say, I love you, and she says, I love you, and it just melts my heart. Or I'll say, Ava, can go, come give me a hug? And she'll say, no, and I'll hug her anyways. 
And I love doing that, but it just means so much more. There's something deeper when it comes from her. When she sees me, on Sunday mornings when I wake up, she's still asleep when I leave the house, and so I'll come to church, and then she'll come later. And most times, <laughs> I can't say every time, most times she sees me, and she, she yells, Daddy, and she'll come running up to me, and that just... It just means so much to me. It's as if she's saying, I love you. She's making the choice to show me that she loves me. And God wants us to be in the same position. So why does God allow evil? Well, he gives us free choice. He gives us free will so we can choose to love him. Now, um, also, <clears throat> along this question, why does God allow e evil in this world? Why does God allow suffering? Um, God wants us to, to, I believe, learn more about him. He wants us to see him in the suffering. Now, at any point, God could stop. If God could stop evil, if we say, okay, God's got to stop evil tonight at midnight, right? And we're looking forward to it, we're looking forward to it. Tonight at midnight, everything's just going to be great. Now, how, how many of us, if we're honestly asking ourselves, how many of us would still be here? If he removes evil, then wouldn't he remove us as well because we all have sin? the sin nature, sin in our hearts. He chooses to leave things exactly the way they are so we can see that he has re revealed himself through the suffering of his own son, Jesus Christ. Go to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, look at verse 7. Isaiah 45, 7. God is so sovereign over all things, but he's not the author of evil. We'll unpack that thought in just a second. He's sovereign, but he's not the author of evil. P Pastor Kenny preached on that, his whole ser uh, sermon on that last week. God's not the author of evil. He didn't create evil. Isaiah 45, 7 says, I form the light, I create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Evil or suffering is the absence of, does anyone remember from last week? Good, <laughs> right? So number three, so number two was why does God allow evil? We saw Job's suffering, we saw Job's friends, they weren't really helpful. Um, and number three, what do some people do with the fact of suffering? People see the fact of suffering, people see and know it, and what do they do with it? They try and rationalize it in their own mind. They try and justify it in their own mind or they try and get rid of it. But the first thing that people try and do with evil or suffering is some will try and convince themselves that it isn't real at all, that it's just an illusion. That the pain we feel can be overcome with our mind and they have that mind over matter mentality. Some people think it's just an illusion. I'll just, if I ignore it, then it's gone. If I ignore the problem, then it's gone. But when we ignore our problems, they're not gone. When we ignore our sin, it's not gone. When you ignore maybe a bill or a debt collector calling you, they don't go away. Others attempt to reject God and say that he doesn't exist in the first place because of evil. We, we looked at that, the Epicurus, the quote, I believe that he was trying to say, God doesn't exist. How can he exist when there's evil? How can a good, good God exist and allow such an evil Rejecting God only will remove the possibility of providing a meaningful answer to the predicament or the evil in the first place. And evil, like I, said, I stated this earlier, evil is actually an argument for God. Objective evil presupposes objective good. The objective good presupposes evil. Quote from Frank Turek. Now this I got from Frank Turek as well. This kind of brought it all together. That quote kind of made it come alive. Evil only exists as a lack of a good thing, like cancer. If you take all of the cancer out of someone's body, what do you have? A good body, a healthy body, someone who's healthy. But listen to this. If you take all of the body out of the cancer, then what do you have? Nothing. It ceases to exist. There's nothing there. If you take all of the rust out of a rusty car, what do you have? A nice car rust-free car. But if you take all of the car and remove it from the rust, what do you have? Rust. Nothing. No car. <laughs> right? So evil just only exists out of a lack of the good. Darkness only exists because of the absence of light. We don't, turn on, we don't have switches back there that say, okay, now it's time to turn on the darkness when everyone leaves. 
What do we do? We shut the lights off, and it removes the light. And darkness just immediately comes in. C.S. Lewis says, My argument against God, when he was an atheist, he wrote this book um, afterwards, but it says, My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? He was comparing, when he says the world is unjust, he was comparing it with justice, with God's justice. We see God, and we know that there is evil. We know there is sin because God gives us the plumb line, like Pastor uh, Kenny was speaking about this morning, and everything off of that, we see, okay, this is evil, this is suffering, this is sin, whatever it is. Without God, we can't make any sense of the evil or the suffering that we face because when we remove God, we remove the moral um, compass or remove the, the plumb line from the which we have. We remove the good from the bad, like the body from the cancer. The great moral dilemma of pain and evil and suffering is not rectified by rejecting God. It is exacerbated by rejecting God. It just makes the problem worse. Because with God, we at least have a point of reference. Without God, the whole thing is just a mess. So some people will try and uh, reject God and say that God doesn't exist, that there's, there's no source of good, but we know that there has, we have to understand what good is with only a God there. Only because of God is what we know what evil is. Excuse me. And then thirdly, others will attempt to redefine who God is. People will take God and they'll try and maybe change him. We, we do this on our own. We think, well, I, I don't believe that God would, would say it that way. When God said this, when God says, don't do this, I, I believe he kind of meant it this way. And we'll try and twist it to try and justify our own life and to try and fit our life into some mold that we think God puts us in. So others will try and attempt to redefine God. Um, Rabbi Kushner he wrote a book, when, when Bad Things Happen to Good People. He's a rabbi. He's a Jewish man. He believes there is God, but listen to what he says. He says, there is a God, but he is not all-powerful. He says, we advise you to love God and to forgive him despite his limitations. So, so he is trying to, to, to redefine God or to try and change who he is. Well, God exists. We have this creator. We have this loving God, but he's not all-powerful, and he has limitations. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not sovereign. Now, sometimes we wrongly, wrong, wrongly, or some people will wrongly think that this solves the problem by denying the omnipotence of God. Go to Isaiah chapter 64. If you're still in 45, it's just a few uh, chapters ahead. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Now, when we take away the omnipotence of God, when we try to at least, then we say that he can be willing, but he's not able to solve the issue of evil. I mean, he really wants to. He really wants to, to get rid of all this evil. He really wants to get rid of all this sin. He's just not quite able to. Kind of a slap in the face for God with all the goodness that he does for us, all the mercy and grace he shows when we say, mm, God, you're just not quite good enough. Make God just some man. But who are we to redefine God? Who are we to say who God is, right? Amen. We're not in that situation. God is the one that created us. God is the one that formed us. We don't have that, that, that authority to do that. And when we try and do that, maybe we try and justify it, or we just maybe just try and tweak him a little bit. We, we say, oh, I believe God is omnipotent. I believe God is omniscient. I believe God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. He can do everything. But this one little, this one little commandment, I think he meant it this way. We're redefining God. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the what? Clay. clay. We're the clay. And thou art the potter. And we all are in the work of thy hand. doesn't say God's in the work of our hand. doesn't say God's the clay and we can mold him however we want to. So some people will deny the evil and existence of it and says it's only just an illusion. This doesn't really exist. Some people will reject the idea of God and say, well, God doesn't exist. You have the atheist. Say, God's not real because evil's real. That only makes it worse because we take away the reference point from which uh, we have of what good is. And thirdly, some people will try and redefine God, but we're not in a position to redefine God. We're not in the position to tell God who he is and what he does. 
So we see all this. We know suffering is real. We see Job went through it. We see all the suffering that he went through. We've, we've, we've looked at what people will try and do with suffering, how they try and justify it, how they try and get rid of it maybe, try and rectify it in their mind, try and justify it. Um, now, I, I have this video. If you can, we don't have to get the lights. You don't have to turn the lights off. But if you can make sure the uh, sound is up, and then Caleb, if you can hit the video real quick. Good. If he is, why is there suffering and evil? Let's assume for the moment that God is all-powerful. This means that God can do anything that is logically possible. So he can create galaxies and subatomic particles and rainforests and you. But God cannot do what is logically impossible. He cannot make a square circle or a one-ended stick. So can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? No. So what if when God created human beings, he wanted them to be free? Freedom's a good thing, but if humans are to be free, they cannot be forced to obey God. Because freedom without choice is like a square circle. It's a logical contradiction. No choice, no freedom. God didn't want robots. He wanted real people. The first humans endowed with the awesome power of free choice abused their freedom. The tragic consequences of their bad choice and our bad choices ripple across the world. God is responsible for the fact of freedom, but humans are responsible for their acts of freedom. But let's remember, we don't suffer alone. God will put an end to suffering and evil. And God became a man to suffer with us. God is good, and he wants real people like you to know him but the free choice is yours. So lastly, I want to look at what is God's will or desire for our suffering? What can we see in it? What's the purpose of it? Number one, we have to, to believe or we have to understand that we just live in a world full of sin. We're in, we live in an imperfect world, so because of sin, there's going to be evil. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. Sometimes we bring that on ourselves or the result of someone else's sin. We cannot change that. It's eventual that we're going to get hurt. It's eventual that we'll get sick. It's eventual that we're all going to die at some point. Matthew 5.45 says this, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on, uh, rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So we have, God is showing us in Matthew he doesn't just withhold the evil from Christians. He says, on the just and the unjust, evil falls. The sun rises on the evil and the good. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. So there's sin in our world. There's nothing we can do to get rid of the sin in our world. But we can look through the pain, through the suffering, and think, what, God, what do you want me to see through this? So God uses suffering to sometimes be corrective, to try and bring his children back to him. God will sometimes use pain and suffering to correct us and bring us back to him. Hebrews 12, 5, or verse 5 through 11. If we can all go there real quick. I'll, I, wanna, I want us to all take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as the children... My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son to whom he receiveth. So sometimes the pain, the suffering that we feel is because he's trying to bring us back to him. He's trying to correct something. He wants us to see him. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof... Um, all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of the spirits and live? Verse 10, For they verily, <clears throat> excuse me, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. <laughs> no one looks at their suffering, 
No sane person looks at their suffering and, and says, oh, I love this. But grievous, nevertheless, afterwards it yieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Makes us, God uses the suffering, the pain, to make us look more like him, to look more like Jesus. So God uses it to be corrective. Sometimes God will use it to be constructive. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4, if you just want to listen to this one. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Tribulation worketh patience, says the apostle. Naturally, it is not so. Tribulation worketh impatience, and impatience misses the fruit of experience and sours into hopelessness. So that's the opposite of what he's trying to say. Usually, we'll ha we think of it the other way, that the tribulation will lead to hopelessness. It sours our patience, but God uses it to be constructive. He, want, he sees what he wants us to be, and he's trying to make us that way. He's trying to get us to be something. God puts us through the, a fiery trial, we've heard. He's trying to refine us to be better on the other side. Some virtues that we have can only be developed with evil and the risk. So listen to this. We don't have courage without danger. If there's no danger, you can't be courageous. If there's no obstacles, you can't persevere. If there's no suffering, you can't have compassion. If we don't have tribulation, then we can't learn patience. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us as, for, as far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which we have seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, talking about the suffering that he's talking about, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It says our light affliction. There's something on the other side that I believe God wants us to eat. God uses affliction, suffering, and pain so that we may see him. We experience pain and suffering so that God also may be glorified. Go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. The man had no choice. It's not like he could have done anything wrong. He couldn't have done anything. He was born blind. That's the way God decided to make him for a purpose, on purpose. And the disciples, verse 2, asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why is he blind, they were asking was it because his parents sinned? Did he sin? So they're uh, attributing his blindness, or what they would classify as evil maybe, to something that was done. But look what Jesus says. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. They, ha they had sinned, but he wasn't saying they were sinless. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God says, I wanted to use him so that people can see my goodness, they can see my works, they can see my love, so they could see... Me is what God was saying. He, wants to, he wanted to use it. There are times that we go through things, and in the moment, it's not joyous like we read earlier. In the moment, we don't look at, we don't like it. In the moment, we think, this is confusing. I don't like it. Why is this happening? And it's not apparent why God's letting us do it until we get through it, and we can look back and we think, I see why God was doing that now. Consider that car accident that the, the student that I went to college with his family wasn't looking at him and think, oh, I, I understand why God's doing this. They tried, to, they tried to reason it. They tried to say, I believe God's doing this. But they didn't know why until they got through it. And they could look back and they could say, this man is saved as a result of the evil car accident that we would classify it as. And sometimes it's just simply God's plan um, for us to go through things. Joseph. It was God's plan, I believe, for Joseph to go through what he did. His brother sold him into slavery. Slavery. He was accused of adultery, or, um, and all these different things happened to him. But at the end, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says, But as for you, Joseph is speaking, it says, Ye thought evil against me, speaking to his brothers. It said, You sold me into slavery because you meant it for evil. You were trying to get rid of me because you didn't like me. There was jealousy. There was hate. But he says, But God meant it unto good. God meant the evil for good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. The quote that Epicurus says doesn't consider the fact that God can use evil and God will use evil, and sometimes that is his plan. It says if evil exists, then God can't exist. But what he doesn't un understand is 
God exists and evil exists, and God will use the evil to bring about good. The same God who chooses to bless you with a lovely sunset may choose to bless us with the experience of suffering. We don't know what he's trying to do, but as long as we stick by him and stay with him, when we come through it, we can look at our God and say, I love you even more. When we become Christians, evil, pain, and suffering does not cease to exist in our life. God uses pain, illness, suffering, crushed hopes, stupid choices that we do to test our faith and to make us better, stronger, wiser, and to love him more. Listen to this. This is a quote I found. I don't know who, who came up with this, this quote, um, but it's not mine. It says, pain will cause a child to cry for their mom. When a child goes through pain, when they fall, they hurt their knee, or when they break a bone, they cry for their parents most times. God uses pain, evil, suffering to cause us to cry for him. God uses suffering. God uses evil. Evil exists, and so does, go- so does God. It doesn't make God less. It doesn't make him less loving. It doesn't make him unlovely. When we look at what we see around us, we're in a sin-cursed world. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. But because he loves us, sometimes he uses it for our good to make us look more like him. God is still good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, and I, um, as, as difficult as this topic is to maybe understand or to maybe rationalize in our mind, maybe we've heard it, maybe we've studied it before in the past, but, and sometimes we just look at it and we think, I still don't understand. But God,